Okay, so the stream is working. Let's also do the recording just as a backup. All right, uh, so welcome everyone to today's session of the InfoSec Research Seminar. It's my great pleasure to introduce Java uh, Xu, who is a lecturer in the financial computing uh, uh, in financial computing at UCL. And uh, she teaches here on blockchain technologies and machine learning in finance. She's also affiliated with the uh, Center for Blockchain Technologies and the program director for the MSc in Emerging Digital Technologies. Um, and Java's research interests are primarily on blockchain economics, behavioral finance and risk management. And uh, yeah, today she brought us a topic on decentralized exchanges and automated market makers. Uh, Java, take it away. Thank you very much for the intro, Philip, and thanks so much for having me. So today what I'm going to present is a uh, kind of a survey paper, or we call it SOK systematization of knowledge on um, this new DeFi protocol, decentralized exchanges or DEX with automated market maker protocols, AMM protocols. Um, so what we wanted to achieve in this survey paper, first of all, we want to generalize the mechanisms, the economics of AMM-based decks, uh, automated market making based uh, uh, decentralized exchange with some kind of formalized state space modeling framework. We want to compare some major uh, AMM protocols um, with some mathematically uh, mathematical derivation and parameterized illustration on their conservation function, slippage, and divergence loss functions. I'll explain, of course, more in depth what those words mean exactly. Um, and also we want to position AMM-based decks uh, within a broader taxonomy of DeFi, which is going to come in a second, and also examine the relationship uh, and interactions between AMM-based decks and other DeFi protocols. Um, last but not least, I think this point would interest um, this audience most, the InfoSec audience, is that we want to establish uh, some kind of high-level taxonomy of, uh, of security privacy issues concerning AMM-based decks, and we want to explore some mitigation solutions. So um, before diving directly into uh, um, AMM-based decks, for those of you who are probably not quite familiar with decentralized finance, I just want to give you a brief um, uh, definition or, 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 or uh, kind of like scope what, de what DeFi means. So DeFi, decentralized finance, uh, we define it as a rule-based financial system that operates according to protocols composed of smart contracts on blockchains. So yeah, basically you can imagine DeFi as some kind of financial, um, financial entity or a bank on top of built on top of blockchain and <coughs> the, the operation rules are uh, coded in in smart contracts uh, running on top of blockchain so mainly uh, mainly uh, uh, smart contract compatible uh, blockchains such as uh, such as ethereum um, we have a couple of DeFi um, application categories here and of course today we're going to focus on the first category uh, decentralized decentralized exchanges but it is very important to mention some other DeFi protocols because as um, introduced in uh, one of the earlier slides we will also be talking about the interactions between um, AMM based decks and other DeFi applications as well so uh, in the DeFi whole ecosystem, we have first and foremost decentralized exchanges. Uh, I list here some big players, Uniswap, Balancer, Curve, and Dodo, which are also the four major AMM-based uh, DEXs that we are exploring in the, in the paper. And then we have lending protocols. 
uh, also just a few major players, MakerDAO, Compound, Ave, and then yield aggregators or yield farming protocols. We have Yearn Finance, Harvest Finance, Pickle Finance, um, as well as some uh, insurance protocols such as Nexus Mutual, um, EtherRisk, and, uh, and Insure. Um, so yeah, again, you can view DeFi applications just as some kind of financial um, entities running on top of on top of blockchains. And the reason why they are called decentralized finance is uh, because they are not controlled by some central authority. They are not controlled by um by 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 one or two kind of owner of the of the company but uh, but they are controlled by um the community what well, we call that the community using the defi jargon or the protocol token holders more on that uh, later so again our main um subject here that we study we examine here um is is decentralized exchange in the defi ecosystem so DEX with automated market maker protocols, um, how do we define that? So basically they are, they use those AMM based DEXs, they use a so-called conservation function that uh, determines exchange rates between crypto assets algorithmically, or well, they are crypto assets because they are, you know, they're running on top of blockchain. Um, so um, this, it's, it's important to distinguish between AMM based um, exchange and uh, order book based exchange. Um, so with order book exchange, you always, if you want to make a trade, you always have to match a buyer and a seller, right? So if you want to, let's say buy, um, you know, one Bitcoin, you can go to the market. Of course, you can you can make a market order, or you say I want to buy one Bitcoin with uh, with uh, fifty thousand um, USD. You can place an order, and on the other side, if somebody is willing to sell one Bitcoin with um, sixty thousand USD, then the trade will um, will succeed. So that's how order book based uh, uh, market making works with. Uh, Decentralized with AMM based decks, however, you're not really trading with another peer with the, with the, with the, with the, with the, another um, exchange counterparty. You're trading against a liquidity pool. So instead of uh, defining, let's say, four variables in our previous example, you're defining, you know, your 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 selling asset, which is uh, which is USD, your buying asset, which is Bitcoin. And then the selling quantity, which is um, sixty thousand, you're selling. Well, you you are actually selling USD to buy uh, BTC, right? And then the buying quantity, which is one one BTC, uh, you don't define all these two uh, four variables. Uh, instead, you only define three of the four variables, which would be the uh, selling asset, buying asset. So in our case, Bitcoin and USD. And then you either define that you're gonna you're gonna buy one Bitcoin, or you define that you're gonna sell sixty thousand USD, and the algorithm, the conservation function, will automatically decide the exchange rate. So based on your trade and the the state of the um, of the protocol, it's gonna automatically calculate uh, what the exchange rate should be, what's a, what the price should be. So we'll have more um illustrations on how bonding curves work later um it is uh, also important to note that um amm and dex they are they are actually not mutually inclusive although we tend to even even in our own paper probably later on in my presentation i'll probably just refer to amm based dex as amm um, but it's important to understand that those are not those are two concepts of, uh, of different two different uh, dimensions so one refers to the algorithm so amm well the um the 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 opposite well, or let's say on the parallel level of amm is order book based for example it's just like really an, an algorithm how the exchange should work whereas DEX is kind of an application. So you would have uh, under DEX, you would have um, order book based DEX as well, as a matter of fact, and you could also have AMM based DEX, uh, just as the algorithm that I just, I just described, you define, you know, three variables instead of four, and then the AMM, the bonding curve will automatically calculate 
uh, the exchange rate. So AMM can also be used in other uh, in other applications as well. Uh, we have observed in uh, the the DeFi space that uh, people have used AMM for the prediction market, and also they have used AMM for stablecoin protocols and so on and so forth. It's just uh, good to clarify that um, you know AM, when we talk about DEX, usually we refer to AMM uh, based DEX, but you know theoretically you could also have order book based DEX. Um, I think here it is. Uh, important to note why AMM based decks sometimes is more advantageous than order book based decks, especially when we're talking about decks. Decentralized exchange, they're running on top of uh, blockchains. The, 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 the advantage is that if you want to build up order book based decks, you know, you have to store all the orders on top of blockchain. And due to the nature of blockchain, you know, you have um, all those these distributed nodes hosting um hosting all the all the all the data uh running on top of the ledger so it is very um inefficient to host big you know order book data on every single node that that that, that is um participating in the distributed network so amm is just from uh, a data storage point of view, from data storage perspective, a much more um, efficient way uh, for for exchanges running on top of blockchain. Um, so that is basically uh, that was basically how um, AMM based DEX would fit in the DeFi taxonomy. So now let's decompose um, an AMM based DEX where we start with actors. So AMM based DEX, there are mainly uh, here we identified uh, three actors. So they are liquidity providers, exchange users, and protocol foundation. Um, as said, with order book based decentralized exchange, you always have to have a buyer and a seller to be able to make a trade. Whereas with AMM based uh, AMM based exchange, AMM based DEX, you are not trading against the other side of the um, of the order, but instead you're trading against a whole liquidity pool. So you're trading against a pool of assets, and this liquidity pool, the liquidity or the funds um, inside the liquidity pool, they're exactly provided by liquidity providers. Um, well, the, these are the uh, the name that we give to to the people that provide liquidity to the pro liquidity pool, uh, LPs or liquidity providers. So, if you want to become a market maker, then you uh, of an AMM based DEX, then you can initiate a liquidity pool by supplying some funds into a pool smart contract, and um, other liquidity providers, they can add some funds into the pool or receive uh, add some funds into the pool. They can, of course, also withdraw funds from the pool. Uh, when they add funds into the pool, they'll receive um, this, this certificate called pool shares. So how do we understand that? For example, I want to, I want to uh, uh, open a pool. I, have an, I just minted a new token on, on Ethereum that's called let's say let's call java token j j token um and let's say no oh, this is sorry the pen is not working anymore uh so let's say i want to uh, create a liquidity pool of J token against ETH, uh, which means that I want people to be able to, you know, buy J token with some ETH, or later on they can sell J token um, and get some ETH back. Um, so to do that, I could theoretically, uh, let's say, provide uh, ten J token into the pool uh, paired with paired with uh, five ETH, for example, and I would get some. Uh, liquidity pool shares. As I am the first um, uh, liquidity provider, I'll get 100% of the pool share. So I will get, uh, yeah, let's say, let's say I will just get 100 pool shares. And later on, some other liquidity provider come in and, and join me. And for example, this other liquidity provider provided 5J token and 2.5 ETH proportionally, then obviously proportionally, this other liquidity provider would get 50 pool shares. Simple as that. 
So when we withdraw our liquidity from the pool, uh, we withdraw also proportionally based on the pool share that we hold. So that's liquidity providers. And then we have exchange users. Those are the kind of the target clients that uh, uh, AMM based uh, decks trying to serve. Um, so the exchange user, well, those are just traders. They 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 come to the pool to buy J token or they come to the pool to sell J token, and then the conservation function would automatically determine the uh, the price. And last but not least, we have protocol foundation. Those are the the uh, developers. Um, the, the the designers of the protocol, they are financially incentivized to make the protocol competitive. Um, as we have seen in uh, one of the um, first few slides, there are multiple AMM based decks out there. Um, so it is important to make sure that your your the design of the protocol is is uh, as competitive as possible, such that you can attract as much volume as possible. And the protocol foundation uh, has the incentive to do that because they tie their um, revenue uh, with uh, uh, with uh, the traffic that they, that they attract, and uh, w w with every single trade, they will uh, charge a, a certain percentage as the fee. Um, so the assets running on top of a DEX, uh, AMM based DEX, we have risk assets. Those are usually illiquid assets um, that AMMs are designed for. For example, the, the uh, I just mentioned, you know, Java token or J token. Uh, it is a token that I just minted and it, it's probably gonna take forever, uh, you know, to go through all the due diligence and paperwork to get this token listed in a, in a kind of more serious centralized exchange such as Binance. So uh, to get the to get the token circulated straight away to 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 um, to make sure that people will be able to purchase this token, I can easily just create a liquidity pool. Um, this is the this is more attractive way of getting your um, of deploying your 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 token uh, and uh, and uh, and the way that people are adopting more and more as an alternative to ICO or initial coin offering. I believe a lot of you have heard of that. So now the alternative way of doing that is IDO initial DEX offering. Um, so those are the risk assets, um, and then base assets. Those are usually the less volatile assets to pair with uh, risk assets such as ETH, Ethereum, and then we have pool shares. I just um, explained with the previous example already. Those are just ownership certificates in a portfolio of assets um, that represent um, your fraction of um, the funds that you own in the liquidity pool. And then we have governance tokens. Um, as said, you know, we have the protocol foundations that are uh, financially incentive incentivized to design the, uh, the, the uh, protocol and to make them as attractive as possible. So one way to make them attractive is to issue some kind of governance tokens as a reward to, uh, to protocol participants. Uh, you know, to attract them to to come to the to come to the uh, um, decentralized exchange to trade there. When they trade there, they get rewarded uh, with protocol with protocol tokens or governance tokens. And for liquidity providers, it, you know, they get the reward. They get rewarded as well if they provide liquidity into their protocol. Sometimes they will also get rewarded with governance tokens. So why governance tokens would have value? Uh, it's well, it's something that that is difficult to 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 explain. It's a bit out of scope. Um, of course, there's speculation there. Um, but at the end of the day, the, you if you hold a governance token, you know you can participate in the governance of the protocol. As said, decentralized finance they're not owned by one single um, one single authority, but they are owned by by the whole community. So if you hold some governance tokens, um, theoretically you own a piece of the protocol as well, and you have a say in um, governance issues related to the protocol. Um, so here, a kind of stylized mechanism to explain how AMM uh, works. I think in my previous slides, I have already 
explained um, quite in detail, but let's just go through real quick. So we have we have um, the core actors, which are the liquidity providers and then exchange users. Liquidity providers, they would provide liquidity into the pool. When they provide liquidity into the pool, yeah, you see that inside the pool, the pool state will change such that, you know, the, the, the quantity of the assets in the pool will increase. Um, and at the same time, if you provide liquidity, you will be issued um, with um, pool shares or liquidity shares. So we also call that mint LP shares. So they come in form of tokens. So when we provide liquidity, the reserve of the pool will increase and also uh, the, the total quantity of liquidity shares will also increase. Of course, when you withdraw some liquidity, um, the liquidity will decrease and also some pool shares will be burned. And exchange users, their main action is just swap. When they swap, they will, you know, one uh, token will increase and then the other side will decrease. So for example, if I want to buy J token uh, with some ETH, then basically I will put ETH into the pool. So ETH will increase in the in the pool reserve and J token will decrease because I'm buying J token. So I'm taking J token out of the liquidity pool, essentially. Um, so now the conservation function, how that works. So the conservation, so the, the, the basic uh, form of a conservation function is this Uniswap conservation function um, or what we call a um, constant product conservation function. So constant product conservation function can be expressed easily as x1 times x2 um, uh, is equal to C. So here, uh, in our this 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 uh, stylized example, C is thirty six hundred. So the initial initial reserve is at this point seventy two fifty. So we would so we have seventy seventy two ETH and fifty some other token. Let's let's say it's called my token. And then the initial spot rate of my token uh, can be expressed as one point four four. So how do we calculate that so basically you can you can see it as you know if you trade against the pool you can calculate the slope here it's basically if you if you um you know buy some my token the my token uh, reserve will decrease so it will go down a little bit here and then if you buy my token with eth the reserve of eth will increase so that's basically the spot rate. So if you calculate the slope here, you will get the spot rate. Of course, the amount has to be uh, infinitesimal amount. And then spot rate is 1.44. Um, and as an example, if you if you if you trade with the, with quite a significant amount, of course, the the um, uh, the reserve will move, um, and it has to move uh, along this bonding curve. Uh, this conservation function we call we also call it a bonding curve um it's kind of fixed when you are when you're trading so um if you in this example if one sells my token seven uh, 70 my token that means that the quantity of um my token will increase you know you sell which means that you put my token into the pool and you sell, you want to get some ETH. So you get some ETH out of the pool. So obviously uh, the quantity of my token will increase. And then once, once it's increased, you can calculate um, the end state of, uh, of ETH, the quantity of ETH using the conservation function. So the end state is, uh, is, is 30. All right, so, and then you can see that the new spot rate of my token is 0 0.25, which is also very, very intuitive because, you know, you have more supply um, in the market, more supply of my token, and you're selling my token, which would push the price of my token down. So it's intuitive that initially the spot price is 1.44 and afterwards it's 0 0.25. So that's that's basically the idea. Um, so we mentioned two risks associated with um, uh, with the AMM based DEX. So there are two implicit economic risks. One is called implicit cost. Uh, sorry, one is called slippage, and then the other one is called divergence loss. So slippage 
is basically what well, you would experience slippage with uh, um, with order book based exchange as well. But with uh, AMM based exchange, um, especially when the curve is like this, the bonding curve is like this continuous, the slippage you would experience is also continuous slippage. So in this case, slippage means that, you know, the initial spot spot price that you experience uh, would be different from the the actual trading price so in our example the initial spot price of my token 1.44 but the actual trading price is 0 0.6 so you encounter a slippage of uh 58 so that's the slippage and the divergence loss we also call it impermanent loss is so slippage is the economic kind of risk that a, a trader needs to consider, the exchange user needs to consider. When the exchange user make a trade, he needs to know that it's trading against a liquidity pool and the rate that's been displayed by the liquidity pool is not necessarily the rate that uh, he will get at the end of the day due to slippage. Um, and divergence loss is associated with um, economic cost on the side of liquidity providers. What does that mean? That means that for liquidity providers, it's actually worse off to put their tokens, to put their funds into a liquidity pool um, as a market maker um, than to just, to just hold their liquidity outside of the pool. So in, this, in our particular example, the, um, the new reserve here, the new reserve of the pool is actually 30 uh, times 260, or you can calculate this way, 30 plus 120 times, what do we say, uh, times, uh, yeah, 1.44, um, oh, sorry, 0. sorry, 0. 0.25, 0. 0.25. So that's basically, that's basically 60. So that's the new reserve values. Basically, if I am the sole owner of this liquidity pool, after this trade, um, the value of my funds would be 60. Whereas if I didn't provide liquidity into the liquidity pool, but I have held liquidity outside of the liquidity pool, then I would have got 50, I would have got exactly the same, you know, uh, a quantity of, of funds. So I would have got 50 times the, the updated price due to market selling pressure, 0 0.25 plus uh, 72, which is the amount of ETH, then um, the, the new value of the initial reserve would be 84.5. So which means that, you know, by providing liquidity into the liquidity pool, I'm worse off by 29%. So that's divergence loss. Um, so the way to compensate for this divergence loss is to uh, use transaction fees. So instead of you know, uh, allowing traders to transact for free, we apply this transaction fees so that the uh, liquidity providers get compensated a little bit. So um, yeah, here I'll just go very briefly as uh, some um, uh, charts on, on different mechanisms of different protocols. Um, so uh, the most basic one we just introduced is the Uniswap constant product um conservation function and then with uniswap v3 um they have introduced a new feature which is called concentrated capital so instead of instead of allowing um the uh allowing the 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 liquidity to be um able to serve traders who come and go at any point um, you can specify that my liquidity can only serve traders who will trade against this price range so in that case you would have a slightly different uh, um, uh, uh, bonding curve and the slippage and divergence loss would also look a little bit different so just to give you a feel of how this looked like um, of course, we're not going to go through the mathematical derivation here in the presentation, but you are more than welcome to have a look in the in the paper and uh, and play with the code that we have uh, made open source on GitHub. And with Balancer, um, this is also a slight uh, variant variation of of the uh, constant uh, product conservation functions. So instead of allowing only two assets, they allow more than two assets, uh, each with a fixed value weight WK. So basically, you know, uh, previously when I do uh, J token and, uh, and ETH, um, if I want, you know, I do initial 
coin listing if I want my J token to be um, worth of one ETH, then every J token to be worth of one ETH, then if I deploy a hundred J token with Uniswap constant, constant product uh, conservation function, I have to pair that with exactly hundred ETH as well. So that's a lot of funds that I need to put in um, as, a, as, a, as an initial liquidity provider. But if I use balancer, then I can apply some kind of a weight. So I can say that the the value of J token is uh, weighs 90%, whereas the value of ETH weighs only 10%. So I can initiate a liquidity pool with less ETH. So that's also why Balancer has been also an attractive um, attractive uh, protocol for um, uh, for for DeFi protocols that want to raise capital and want to use IDO to 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 attract capital to deploy their token, and then we have Curve. Curve is um, designed for uh, for the exchange of two tokens with the with similar peg. So, for example, uh, USDT, uh, which is pegged to USD, and also Dai, which is also pegged to USD. So they have they use this kind of interpolating factor A that uh, makes sure that you know when A is large, then you you can incur very very low slippage. So you can see that a slippage is 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 quite flat. Um, um, but of course, at the same time, you know, if um, if the if the pool is near depletion, then the slippage also go kind of exponential. So curve serves a different purpose. So it makes sure that within um, a certain price range, the slippage is very very low uh, with this uh, with this interpolating factor um, a. But when a is low, then you can see that the conservation function is similar to the most basic form, the Uniswaps. Uh, constant uh, constant product form. And then we have Dodo, uh, another interesting protocol. Um, Dodo is interesting because it is using this proactive market making algorithm. So they anchor their price with a market price P. Um, so they use an external source of um, of price to make sure that their the price that they display oh is always um, is always anchored to the external source. This is interesting because later on we're going to talk about this as well. Um, because a lot of protocols they actually use um, decentralized exchange as this thing called price oracle. Um, So basically, a decentralized exchange might use um, the exchange rates displayed by, for example, Uniswap or or Balancer uh, to 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 determine the value of uh, of a certain asset. So they use other ex so they use exchanges displayed you know uh, price as a reference. But with Dodo, that's the other way around. Uh, instead of they also have their own displayed price, but they also use another another price oracle, an external price oracle, to make sure that there's no um, there's no big gap between the price that they display and the, the price that's that's provided by an external price source. Um, in which case um, they will they will make sure that the arbitrage an opportunity is um, as little as possible or can be easily uh, closed at equilibrium. Um, so I'm going to skip this one. Uh, this one is just for you to understand, uh, just to test whether you can understand uh, the conservation function or not. But I think, um, conscious of time, I want to jump into associated attacks because that I believe that's the, that's the one that would interest um, this cohort most. So associate attacks with AMM-based um, AMM based, uh, uh, decks, we categorize them into um, three classes. So there are infrastructure layer attacks, middleware layer attacks, and application layer attacks. So infrastructure layer attacks, we identify that there are um, uh, block timestamp manipulation so basically, you can manipulate the timestamp to, to, to change the order of transactions. And then even within one block, 
you can also manipulate the uh, transaction transaction sequence. So they're both um, uh, those two attacks. Um, they're both used to achieve kind of like um, uh, malicious ordering of transactions. Malicious ordering of transactions um, can the purpose that this kind of attack would serve is to, for example, to front run uh, some orders that are placed to, to, uh, to the exchanges. And then on the middleware, uh, middleware layer, we have a uh, re-entrancy attack. Um, this is really uh, connected to um, a smart, some smart contract box. Re-entrancy attack is basically you can enter the smart contract um, again and again, uh, where it sh shouldn't happen at all. And then we have application layer attack, uh, which I will um, explain a little bit more in detail later on. So those attacks include a uh, vampire attack, rock pool, um, price oracle attack, sandwich attack, front running and, uh, and back running. Um, and implicit economic risks uh, we have already identified. They have um, their slippage and their divergence loss. Um, the slippage would enable those Oracle attacks, sandwich attacks, and also front running and back running. We'll see that more in detail later on when we show the algorithm of the attacks. And also there are some privacy concerns associated with uh, AMM-based uh, based attacks. Um, it is exactly due to the fact that AMM-based stacks are running on top of transparent, or at least most of them, they're running on top of transparent, public, and permissionless blockchains. And you can always observe the transactions posted on blockchains. As a matter of fact, even before they're committed to a blockchain, you can already observe those transactions in the mempool. Uh, if you have not heard of this uh, this concept, so transactions first go to mempool and then they get validated and get committed into the blockchain. So through transaction inspection, you know, uh, malicious malicious users can 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 do some kind of uh, transaction ordering manipulation, uh, such that they can achieve front running, back running, and some other attacks. And then of course. Um, due to the fact that the transactions can be observed, there's also identity tracing and also uh, behavioral model inference, um, those concerns associated with open um, AMM-based decks running on public blockchains. Um, so as said, I want to go a bit deeper into um, the selected attacks, especially the the application layer attacks, because they are specific to AMM based uh, based decks. The other attacks, um, they also concern uh, AMM based decks, but they they are also as they are on infrastructure layer and middleware layer, they also concern other uh, blockchain applications. So the first one. Um, that I want to talk about here is flash loan funded price oracle attack. As said, um, some other DeFi protocols use uh, AMM based uh, DEX as a price oracle. One of the example is the lending protocols. Uh, this is exactly why I wanted to give you guys a um, landscape of all the DeFi protocols at the very beginning because they do interact with each other. So lending protocols usually work like this. Um, on, on DeFi lending protocol, all the borrows need to be sufficiently collateralized. So for example, if you want to borrow one ETH, you need to have sufficient collateral put down to be able to borrow one ETH. And this collateral could be, let's say, uh, um, I don't know, uh, 4,000 USDT. So you put down 4,000 USDT and then you can borrow one ETH. It needs to be over collateralized. However, if the, if, the, um, if the value of ETH goes extremely high, let's say the value of ETH goes to um, 8,000, of course, you wouldn't have the incentive as a borrower, you wouldn't have the incentive to repay ETH um, because your collateral is only 4,000. So you don't really care if your collateral gets slashed or get liquidated, right? So the lending protocol, the way they control that is that they fetch the data um, the, the, the price displayed by, by, by uh, decentralized exchanges to decide whether, um, whether a borrow position can be liquidated or not, whether it's 
sufficiently collateralized or not sufficiently collateralized. So with the price oracle attack, what can be done is that uh, market manipulator, they uh, push the price of um, AMM based uh, decks by making a huge trade such that lending protocols that use um, the, 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 the price inferred by AMM based decks, they, uh, they, they, they unknowingly um, think that you know the price has changed and then cause some liquidation of the uh, of the of the collateral of some borrow positions, and then the attacker would consequently liquidate the borrow position with uh, with some kind of bonus provided by lending protocol. And here, um, usually, what they use is this is this thing called flash loan, um, which is even which which makes the attack even more um, kind of uh, well, even less costly because they don't have to have the initial uh, initial funds to make the attack. They can just make a flash loan. A flash loan means that you have to you need to borrow and then you need to repay um, the the funds just within one single transaction. So you can, but one in one single transaction, you can have multiple operations. So you can borrow some funds and then use that funds to interact with AMM based decks and then push the price high. And the lending protocol will see that okay, the price has 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 changed, so they're going to liquidate a few borrow positions, and at the same time, the uh, the attacker could liquidate the borrow position and then repay the fund all in one transaction. So it is indeed very fascinating. So that's price oracle attack, and then second attack that I want to talk about is rock pool. So basically, I had an example of uh, of. Uh, an, an IDO where you know I just minted my own token that's called Java token or Java coin, whatever, and I um, and and I did an IDO in the way that I deploy a uh, AMM based Dex liquidity pool with uh, some Java token and some ETH, and I would advertise my java token in all kinds of you know social media and so on and so forth or maybe this this java token is just a copycat from other more um authentic from other more uh, legitimate projects but as a matter of fact this this java token that i minted myself it's just a scam token so once i attract a sufficient number of traders to buy Java token from my pool with ETH, with the valuable token ETH, then I close the pool completely, such that you know the 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 unwitting traders would end up with some scam tokens, which are Java tokens, whereas me as a scammer, as a attacker, would be able to get all the valuable tokens, which would be ETH. So that's another attack um, that we have also observed in the AMM based decks. And then we have uh, sandwich attacks. So sandwich attacks, basically, um, this is basically uh, kind of manipulating a front run and then back run. It's called sandwich because it needs um, it needs one front running transaction and one back running transaction. So with sandwich LP attack, the liquidity provider would observe whether there's um, some lucrative transactions coming in or not. And they can first front run by withdrawing liquidity such that the liquidity pool becomes extremely thin. And when the liquidity pool becomes thin, you know that when the transaction come in, the, um, the, 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 the price will be pushed um, in a more significant um, uh, in a more significant extent, a more significant degree. And then they can and then they afterwards they can reprovide uh, some liquidity back into the pool and then they can sell some tokens uh, to, 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 to profit from this uh, from the sandwich attack. Um, the other sandwich attack is uh, provided by instead of well, not provided, well, performed instead of by a liquidity provider, but performed by other exchange user. So again, this is done with uh, transaction inspection. They can observe transactions in the mempool, so they can do first front run uh, with higher gas fee. Um, this is because. This is because with blockchain, you can uh, with uh, with Ethereum especially, you can manipulate transaction order 
by you know if you want to front run somebody you could uh, you could achieve so by offering um, a higher gas fee such that the miners would have or the, the the transaction validators they would have the incentive to include your transaction first so they front run um, uh, somebody by place an order first and then once this big order comes in they back run by by selling by do a by do an order with the, with an opposite direction such that they can uh, pocket some profit. We have also some screenshot which shows uh, a sandwich attack. Um, later on, well, I'll be sharing the uh, slides anyway, so you'll be able to observe uh, this exact example through the hyperlink here. So you can see that um, just within this sandwich attacks are extremely common on AMM based decks. You can see that here just within um within a few minutes uh so it's from 10 16 to 10 9 10 19 just within three four minutes you already observe two sandwich attacks with the with the trading pair this is called stall and eth you can see that the buy and sell amount are exactly the same um of star are exactly the same but the but the attacker was able to um, was able to make a, make a profit by this kind of difference, by this price difference. So you can see that it's it's an extremely common um, form of attacks with AMM based decks. Um, so um, future lines of research that we identify here: how can we uh, prevent front running uh, in general, and also. Um, more importantly, how can we design a privacy uh, preserving AMM? Of course, there are solutions um, provided out there in existing literature. Some of them are just uh, a proof of concept. Um, for example, you could probably, you know, let's say um, have have some method to to not disclose the uh, transaction details until they are committed to the blockchain. Um, uh, but we were also thinking, is there a way to design an AMM based DEX that can be bo both privacy preserving such that it protects um, the, 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 the private information of small traders, but also can prevent you know, money laundering or, or, or big wash trading so that when large trades come in, it can kind of show uh, this kind of information. So how can we design this kind of AMM? And how can we design an AMM with the different trade-offs between slippage and divergence loss um, to serve different purposes? And also, uh, we've been talking about, this is less related to security privacy, but uh, uh, more about uh, protocol design. We've been talking about AMM-based decks for spot markets. And is there a way to design AMM-based decks for some other financial uh, product markets, for example, for derivative markets, for, for, for you know, future markets, forward markets, swap markets, or option markets, so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, I hope the timing was okay. And I am open for questions. And thanks for sticking with me for so long. Thank you. I hope... I explain things more or yeah, less. No, per okay. Perfect. Thanks a lot for, for the nice presentation. Uh, let me just briefly stop the stream and the recording and then we can go to the